Father, we thank you, Lord, for this night. I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge shall flow freely tonight, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. Father, I pray less of me and more of you, none of me, and all of you. Think through my mind and speak through my vocal cords exactly the things that you'd have me to say to these, your sheep. I thank you, Father, that you've anointed them with ears to hear, hearts to receive, and a spirit to contain your word. It's in the holy, mighty, all-knowing, all-powerful name of Jesus, the anointed one, and the power of his anointing that I pray. Let all that agree shout amen. amen. Shout amen again. Amen. You've got a hand clap of praise. Amen. Hug the person next to you. You may be seated. All right. So on Sunday, we, uh, we were looking at um, in exclusively Jesus. Uh, we've been talking about taking authority, taking authority. Uh, and we learned that, you know, authority was given to us long, long ago, back in the book of Genesis. God gave man authority. We have the authority. And um, I think the issue that a lot of us have as Christians is a lot of times we don't use, we don't exercise our authority. We don't exercise it. We don't, we don't, we don't trust in it, right? And sometimes we're, 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 we allow ourselves as believers to be used and to be inspired and to be influenced by the enemy. And the enemy is the devil. And what we found out on Sunday is, you know, your wife can be a devil. Nothing? No laughs? Your husband can be a devil. Can we get, can we get a laugh now? Come on, ladies. In other words, they're not devils. Stop thinking of somebody that's, that it's not they're demonic. Or de but what happens is the enemy, right, the devil, attacks us. He attacks our way of thinking. He attacks how we see things, how we view things. And then we allow us, we allow, we then become into what's called differencing or differences of opinions. The wife thinks one thing, the husband thinks another thing. Or you're at work and your boss thinks one thing and you think another thing right? Or you're with your grandchildren and your grandchildren think one way and you think another way, right? The bottom line is the enemy simply uses influence of words and thinking that's contrary to what God says to infiltrate us and to, and, 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 and to, and to get into our hearts. And remember what I've told you. I've told you all this for a long time. He's not going to use a stranger. He's not going to have somebody, you're at the red light, and somebody's going to come and knock on your window and say, you know, you're, you, you, know, you need to do this, this, and this. That's going to go in one ear and out the other. Why? Because what? You don't know them. They don't have no influence in your life. This is what's wrong with the body of Christ today. We're letting everybody and everything influence our lives. I'm even talking about preachers. Some of y'all listen to too many preachers. Think about it this way. Let me ask y'all a question. Is the food at Ruth Chris good? The state? It's good, right? Is the food at Carabas good? It's good, right? The food at Maggiano's, pretty good, right? The food at the Waffle House, pretty good breakfast, right? The food at the IHOP, right? Pretty good breakfast. But how many of you know if you, it's all okay food, but if you eat something different, eat from somewhere different, it's all food. But how many of you know by the end of the week, your stomach's going to be messed up? Doesn't mean the food's bad. You're just putting too much in there. And you need to understand you've been called to a specific. The Bible talks about us being all parts in particular. We all got an assignment. We all got things that we're called to do. And where God has placed you is where the, the nourishment, the feeding the word for what you've been called to do is going to be poured out. Now, I'm not telling you you don't need to listen to air. I'm just telling you you need to, it depends on where you're at in your walk. You need to think about that because these are the things, this is how the enemy does it. He doesn't come to us and, and give us straight things that we, we know aren't the right thing. He gives us subtle things, right? He gives us subtle things. He, he, you know, if you're a Christian girl, He's not going to have the guy just come up and say, hey, can, can we go to the, you know, can we go to the hotel and, and get down tonight? No, if he knows you're, you're a Christian and knows that you're trying to operate in integrity and character, the guy's going to come up and say, you look very pretty today. That's where it starts, right? 
starts with just a nice suggestion. What are you doing for lunch today? He knows you're married. What do you mean, what am I doing for lunch? I got my lunch. You know, and then your girlfriend comes right next to you, and what does she say? Oh, ain't nothing wrong with going to lunch with them. Nothing wrong with that. Then you go to lunch with them. And then a couple of weeks later, you go to lunch with them again. And a couple of weeks later, you go to lunch with them again. Then a couple of weeks later, you start saying, you know, my husband don't do this, this, and this. And my husband don't do this, this, and this. See what I'm saying? It's subtle. If y'all notice when the Bible talks about the, the, the enemy, Satan, came as a snake to eat to Eve, what did it say? He said it was the most what? Subtle. Subtle. Think about how he came here. He asked her a question. Right? Are, 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 are you happy? Are you happy? That's what I do. When people ask me dumb questions, I ask them dumb questions back. Are you happy? I'd be a lot happier if you wrote me a check for a million dollars. I'm happy, but you can make me happier. Amen? So we saw in Genesis that, that, that we have authority and we need to not allow ourselves to be influenced. So, you know, we read a bunch of things, but I wanted to, to just reiterate this and then we'll get on to, to what I want to talk about tonight and the Holy Spirit really worked with me on today um, was I said, we, we learn to believe and others learn to doubt. We learn to plan while others are playing. We choose to study while others choose to play and sleep. We choose to prepare while others daydream. We get to it while others procrastinate. We learn working brings fruit, not wishing. Not wishing. You know how many Christians wish? Some of them even call it hope. It ain't hope. You got, you, you're wishing for something. You know how you know when you're wishing for something versus believing for something? When you ain't taking no action on what you believe in. Say it with me. Faith, faith. without works without is dead. Amen. The purpose of faith is to compel you to work. It's to compel you to do something. It's to compel you to take a next step towards your dream, to make it your reality. We must listen while others are talking. Think about that. How many of y'all ever been in meetings where you see people that, that just, they just can't shut up? We're going to read about this tonight. They always got something to say. They always got an opinion. You know, you don't have to have an opinion about everything. It's okay not to have an opinion. And it's okay to also defer to somebody, even if you may not agree with their opinion. It's okay to defer to the fact that maybe they're right and maybe you're wrong. It's okay. I'm going to do a heart of the matter on effective listening and effective communication. Man, we really struggle right now with communication. Everybody wants to talk. Everybody wants to be seen. Everybody wants to have, there's a spirit of I. That is, in, it is infecting uh, the body of Christ. Everybody's own identity, everybody's own brand, everybody's own business. I tell you all this all the time. I had a guy, give you a great example. I had a guy come out to my house to give me a quote on getting some stuff done. So he took about an hour to come out and do, well, he drove to my house. And then he took about an hour giving me a quote. And the quote was about $3,000 to talk about the, the, the amount of work. So love the guy, loved his knowledge. Um, he's one guy that I really thought had a lot of knowledge and insight into what I needed done. Uh, he talked good, right, friend? Um, and man, we were ready to go. So he sends me over the proposal. I said, okay. Well, I said, first of all, you have, on your proposal, you have everything you're gonna do. I said, however, you don't have a timeline. Well, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm sure you're gonna ask me for a deposit. Right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to need time. Well, I told you, it'd probably take, you know, a couple of days to do this, a couple of days to do that. First of all, understand something. If it's not in writing, it don't exist. So everything we talked about is going to be in this contract or we're not going to do business. Okay. So we get through that part. So, you know, we're going to start this, this, we're going to do this, this, this is going to take two days. I don't mind them estimating. I just need to make sure it ain't going to go into to Christmas. You follow me? 
So we get done. He sends me over the, the thing, Haiti, and he wants a 50% deposit. I said, I don't get 50% deposits. Well, that's the way I run my business, blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna come out of pocket, he says, to buy the materials for your project. So, well, if you're in business, you have to make an investment. That's what it requires. But since you brought up the fact of you coming out of pocket, I'm willing to give you a 25% deposit, which is high, and I'm willing to bet 90% of the work you're doing is labor, not product. He's cleaning my house. He's redoing my pavers. He's doing some very labor-intensive stuff. And like I told him, to prove that I'm right, I will pay for all of the cost of any supplies you have instead of giving you any deposit. Give me the bill to all the supplies you're going to buy. Change the whole conversation. Because I was going to give him 25%, which is about $750. The material he's using probably costs maybe 200 bucks, maybe. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you know, and then the whole conversation changed now again. No, what you want me to do is you want me to front your payroll because you don't know how to run your business. So my point is, here's a guy that because he doesn't know how to run a business, he's a good painter, he's a good plumber, he understands how to do the trade apps. I have no doubt about that. But he doesn't know how to market he doesn't know how to run a business, and he doesn't know how to sell. I've had five people come out and give me the same estimate, and not one of the people who've come out to my house has ever one time asked me one closing question. They don't know how to sell. What's your point, Pastor? What I'm telling you is we got people in the body of Christ telling everybody they need to have a business. You need to be independent. You need Man, there's a lot that goes into running your own business. It's not just open, uh, go get an LLC. That's the new thing now. Everybody's got an LLC. Understand, when you have an LLC and it ain't making no, no money, see? You still got to file taxes on it at the end of the year. See, you, you forgot that and spend that money. See what I'm saying? But we do things that people tell us to do, and that's how we get ourselves in trouble. That's what I'm talking about, these subtle influences that come from around us. Why? Because we're not focused on what God's called us to do. So tonight what I want to talk about is strife. Um, Satan has this, 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 this way of ambushing us. And the Bible tells us to avoid strife at all counts and on all costs. So what is strife? Let me define it for you. Strife is angry or bitter disagreement over fundamental issues. Angry or bitter disagreement over fundamental issues or conflict. That's what strife is. That's what strife is. So let's look at strife. Some people think, uh, and some people have been told that a certain amount of strife is healthy. A certain amount of, you know, going bantering back and forth is healthy. I'm here to tell you anything that causes strife is not healthy. It doesn't matter. If it causes strife, it is not of God. We have to understand some. God, our God, is a God of one thing, and that's peace. Go to Romans chapter 15. Let me show you this. Romans chapter 15. Because the opposite of peace is strife. And we need to understand that. God wants us in peace. Why? Because when we're in peace, we can hear. Remember what Jeremiah was saying? Oh, Jesus your presence, right? You know, when, you know when the presence of God really comes? You know why the presence of God comes when you're in a church setting and you're in praise and worship and all? You know why the presence of God shows up more than he shows up like when you're at work? Because when you're in the church and you're singing to God, there becomes a peace. Because the singing to God and the singing of the word filters out the bills and filters out the argument you just had and filters out your feelings of insecurities and filters out your feelings of inadequacies. <clears throat> so as that's filtered out, peace comes. And as peace comes now, the presence of God can come into your heart. So it's, so it's not an emotion. We just got to get the strife. We got to get resentment. We got to get jealousy. We got to get hatred. We got to get these things out of us. In the book of Romans chapter 15, 
starting in verse 30. I'm going to read this in the, uh, in the message translation. Romans chapter 15, verse 20. Paul says, that's why I plea with you because of our union with our Lord Jesus Christ to be partners with me in your prayers to God. My dear brothers and sisters in the faith, with the love we share in the Holy Spirit, fight alongside me in prayer. He says, ask the Father to deliver me from the dangers I face from the unbelievers in Judea. For I want to make sure that the contribution I carry for Jerusalem will be favorably received by God's holy ones. Watch what he says here, verse 32. Then he will send me to you with great joy in the pleasure of God's will, and I will be spiritually refreshed by your fellowship. Verse 33 says, And now may God, watch this, who gives us peace, see that? And wholeness, do you see that? Be with you all, yes, Lord, so it be. So Paul is talking here about how important he uses the word peace, but he uses it in conjunction with wholeness. That word wholeness means nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. When you become, to, when you experience the God kind of peace, that's separate from strife. Nothing will be missing. And you have to understand something. You can never be with nothing missing unless it's God peace. Because there's always going to be something missing. There's always going to be something broken. There's going to always be something going on in your life to cause you challenges and issues. But it's when you receive God's peace. See, that's why I try to tell people, you know, I, I tell y'all all the time, sin isn't an issue for God. And some people twist what I say and, you know, they say, well, Pastor Nick says you can go sin and do whatever you want and God's good with it. Pastor Nick, he never said that. I've never said that. What I said is your sin life is not going to stop you from going to heaven if you were to die like y'all been taught. You know, hey man, I, I got to get to the confessional before, before I die. You know, the priest comes in and, you know, gives you your last rites. I don't need last rites. I took the first rites. <laughs> the first rites took care of me. I don't need no last rites. Did, did the priest get there and give him his last rites? What does that mean? So the priest didn't get there in time? He decided to stop and get a Starbucks? So now you're going to live the rest of eternity in hell? You know what's really funny about me? I always say I was never really called young or nothing, but you know what? At a young age, at a young age, very young age, I recognized the stupidity and foolishness of religious churches. At a young age. At a young, I used to sit with Father Regensburger at a young age. I had too many questions for him. He couldn't hear anything. No, you just got to go. At a young age. I used to ask, let me ask you a question, Father Regensburg. The Bible says we're all created in God's image and in God's likeness. Isn't that what it says? See, yeah. So you and I are created the same, right? Yeah. I said, so why do I got to confess to you? Help me understand. Just, just show me in the Bible why I got to come and, and get in a box. And why do I got to give, why is mine always 10 or 20 Hail Marys and everybody else's are two or three? <laughs> What's the most you ever got, Dean? <laughs> yeah. I've had 50 many times. Yeah, I hit. Have you ever been told there ain't, there ain't enough? <laughs> Go on. Go and come back. Yeah. I used to do bad things to Father Regensburg. I used to, can I tell you what I used to do Father Regensburg? I used to be studying. I had my study book, and I would take 
nude pictures of women in my book. And when he would come by, Chip, I'd go, hey, look at that, Father Regensburger. I did. I did. I was, I was rotten. I was a rotten kid. I, really, I deserved, man. See, one thing about me, I knew I deserved everything that I got. See, I never, that's one thing about me. I never blamed God for anything. Everything I got, I knew I got. So, but, but the whole, the whole religious thing just, it just never set right with me. And I always, my wife could tell you before anybody ever preached about the righteousness of God, before anybody ever preached the grace message, my wife could tell you, I preached the grace message before anybody ever preached the grace message. I used to tell her all the time. I said either, I used to say it this way, either Jesus paid it all or, or it's the biggest lie ever told. He didn't pay for none of it. He, he can't just pay for the sins that you, I mean, it said he rose with all, A-L-L, power. Now, again, what we got to get in our understanding is the sin still does affect us. It affects our ability to believe. But the sin does not affect what God has already done for us. It doesn't affect what he's laid up for us. Do you understand me? If I leave my kids in my will, Right? They're in my will. Right? They're there. They got 25% each, right? None of them are in here, are they? Yeah. They get 25% each, right? Nothing's going to change that, no matter how stupid they act. But if they act stupid, they're going to question. You know, I just called dad a blankety, blankety, blank, blank, blank. You know, so when they get to the will day, they're going to wonder, am I still in there? Right? Isn't that a great analogy? Right? But if they're living a righteous life, man, they're going to step right in there. Man, what my daddy got for me? Oh, I was his best child. Right? But if you wasn't a good child, if you never taught your dad, if you never were around your dad. I had one of my brothers. My dad passed away. My brother ain't talked to my dad in 15 years. 15 years. Never spoke to him. So, I mean, you know, he was wondering. Am I still in the will? Yes, sir. Not because of anything my dad did, but because of what he chose to do. Do you see it? So again, it's not about what God, God's already done it. And we allow strife to come into our life and we allow people to come into our life and we allow getting these quarrels about the word. We got to line our life up to the word. Watch what he says here about peace. Go to Romans chapter 16. I read you 15. Let me read you. 16, 7, uh, chapter 16, verse 17. Let me read this to you. Watch what he says here. Verse 17, I'm going to read it in the Passion. I'm going to read a lot out of the Passion Bible tonight. Um, Romans 16, chapter 16, starting in verse 17. So Paul here is giving his final instructions. So listen to this. He says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, I'd like to give you one final word of caution. Hey, Paul's giving us one word of caution. He says, watch out for those who cause divisions and offenses among you. Man, we, we know offense is a dangerous game. There are people walking around offended, don't even know they're offended. That's how dangerous offense is. No, no, I'm being sincere. They really, they really don't know. I'm talking about good people. Got a good heart. Love God. And there was something said, man, that they are offended about. Y'all ever been talking to that person? And they say, you, you, you remember seven years ago at the park over at Home of Saturn? And, and you're like, huh? Yeah, you remember we walked down to the boat and you said my legs were ugly. Don't you remember that? You're like, did I say that? You do got some ugly legs, but I don't remember saying that. Right? How many of y'all ever, Right? So that person was holding that offense all that time. And you know it never bothered you because you didn't even remember it. You're like, man, I got to figure that out. Offense always hurts the one that holds the offense. And there's nothing. But pastor, you don't know what they did to me to offend me. There's nothing. You got to understand, offense blocks the blessing of God. But pastor, what if they did something to me and, and it cost me? Sow it. It'd be the best seed you ever sow. Sow it. If it's a hurt, sow it. Sow it. 
So forgiveness that you should forgive. Has Jesus ever forgiven you when you didn't deserve to be forgiven? Think about the audacity of the offended. I read another thing on, on, on Facebook tonight. I see it all the time about church hurt. If somebody put a thing on church hurt and then the person comes, yeah, that church were hurt. That's a different kind of hurt. Why is it different? <laughs> when somebody comes to you, let me not say everybody, 95% of the people that come to you and say they're church hurt, they use that term, know you are more than likely dealing with a person that cannot submit to authority and cannot handle correction. That's where, that's where church hurt comes from. And they don't believe the word because it don't take all that. You don't know what it takes. You only know what it takes based on what you've done. What God had to do in my life to, pur to allow me to get purged of all my nonsense is a lot different than what he had to do to, to, to my wife. My wife was never a rotten person. I was always a rotten person. How many of you know? If you go roll around in, 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 in hay... It's going to take one thing to clean that, but if you go roll around in oil, right, it takes a whole nother level of cleaning to get clothes that have been rolled around in oil clean versus ro clothes that rolled around in hay. Hay's just going to come right off. So don't ever, don't ever, don't ever try to, what does it take? And then you got to forget about what they've done. Then you got to look at what is their calling. Because the Bible says where much is given, much is what? Why do we forget that? The Bible says the hundred, how many of y'all in here want the hundredfold blessing on the seed you sowed tonight? Right? We all want the hundredfold. The Bible says the hundredfold comes with persecution. But we don't want no persecute. Bad today talking about me. That's good. That means the hundred's coming, baby. Let them talk. The only way they can affect you when they talk about you, is if you don't see yourself in the image and the likeness of God. The only way they can affect you when they talk about you is if they have more weight in your life than the Word of God has in your life. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Yes, sir. Watch what he says. He says, and now, my dear brothers and sisters, I'd like to give you one final caution. Watch out for those who cause division and offenses amongst you, when they agonize, antagonize you by speaking of things that are contrary to the teaching that you have received. Do you see that? Don't be caught in that snare. Do you see that? For people like this are not truly serving the Lord, our Messiah, but they are being driven by their own desires for a following utilizing their smooth words and their well-rehearsed blessings that they speak to divide the hearts of the innocent ones. Do you see that? It's called the cut worm. My pastor taught us a message 25 years ago called the spirit of Judas Iscariot. The cut worm, the one that's always in the back working behind. See, all of y'all got a girlfriend that's, that, that's single. And she's, she's, in, she's, she's working, the, the enemy's using her to work on you about your marriage. All you guys got a, got, a, got a homeboy that's single, and the enemy's using him. Man, you know, why are you going to go home tonight, man? Hang out with us, man. What's wrong? You, you, you hand-pecked? She's got that much control over everything. Ain't you a man? Don't you call the shots? What, you a boy? Oh, any of my brothers in here ever heard that conversation? Oh, they do it. Oh, yeah. When I used to be in corporate America, you know, we go out, you know, don't you drink? No. Why not? Because I don't choose to. You know, insecure people, you know, everybody else drinks, so they got to get a drink. And you can tell the real punk. You want to know the real punk Christians? They get Perrier water with a little lime on it. So now it can look like they're drinking so they don't have to answer because they're too afraid to confront, to confront some bully. Now, I don't have to go through a lot of that because people really don't confront me like that. I don't know why it is, but I love when they do. No, I don't. I'm good. Diet Coke is fine for me, and I don't drink that no more. So now it's water. Water's good. Amen? I don't care what anybody thinks of me. 
Especially not you. Do you understand? You got to get, you got to get secure. And people are going to come to you with these strife conversations that cause strife. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. We looked at this on Sunday. We're all created after his image and his likeness, not the world. Not the world. Stop trying to be like the world. That's the problem. Amen. Why, why do you think plastic surgery is through the roof right now? You want to make some money in stock? Find a stock that's doing boob jobs and butt jobs and buy that stock. It's going through the roof. Let me tell you all something, man. I, I went to Miami one time with my wife, and we're, we're in, the, we're in, the, in the, uh, 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 one of those little boats that takes you through Millionaire's Row, right? And we're going down Millionaire's Row, and, you know, on the right is Madonna's house. And on the left, man, Sylvester Stallone's house, right? So we're going down through all these houses. So we come to this turn, Haiti, and the guy says, now I want you all to check out this house to the right. So we go around the turn, and, man, we're coming around and around and around, and I mean the whole place. I mean, it's like, it's like Sylvester Stallone, Madonna, and Eddie Murphy's all together, right? I mean, just this huge. He says, y'all see that house over there? He says, y'all know who owns that? And everybody's throwing out all the famous, you know, is that Michael Jordan's house? Is that, is that uh, what's your boy's name? LeBron. LeBron's house. <laughs> the guy's laughing. He says, you know who owns that house? The man who invented the little blue pill, Viagra. The richest man out here is the man who invented Viagra. Think about that. Think about that. Think about that. You got men that take Viagra. Can you imagine that? You got to be slap crazy. You're going to, first of all, if you're having those kind of problems, you probably have some, some, some flow issues in your body. Now you're going to take a pill that's going to exasperate, right? Is that what it does, Chip? Your, your blood flow. Are you crazy? I mean, you don't think about your heart blowing up. I mean, everything else is blowing up. I mean, right? I'm serious. Pa Pastor Poe, you, Pastor Poe, you say all the time, he said, you know, people would come up to him in college, you know, do you want some drugs? And Pastor Paul always look at him and go, are you a chemist? I'm not going to take it. I don't understand how people get drugs from people and put it in their body, put it in their mouth. Are you crazy? It's like, do we not use our brain? I mean, you got to know that that's negatively affecting something. I mean, it's got to, ne I mean, right? But it just shows how vain the world is. How we want to live up to the world so bad, the world's standards. It's, it's just unbelievable. So we cannot allow ourselves, when strife comes into our life, str listen, y'all like, well, how does that, try to figure out how that relates to strife. Strife is anything that's contrary to God's word. It's, it's what causes you to think differently than the world think. The world tries to change your thinking. I'll give you a great example. I had an engineer one time when we were talking about debt. So, and he says to me, listen, and, and I almost bought this too. I'm telling you, it was good. It really was, because he made a great point. He asked me a question. He said, what's the least amount of money return you've ever made on money you invested? So you know me, I'm a good investor, right, Jay? You know I'm a good investor, man. You shake your head, man, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, anyway, I said, I don't know. I, I said, I don't think I've never made under you know, 5% or something like that. He said, okay. He said, now think about it, Nick. You're paying cash for your cars. You could take that $80,000, right, Harry? And Harry can get you a 1% interest rate if you have a good credit or 2% or whatever. I just looked at one today, it was 0 0.09. So that's not even 1%. You could take that $80,000 instead of doing what Pastor Nick says and buying it cash. You could take the 80000 finance it, and make 4% a year off the 80000 right, Jay? So you literally can make, makes sense, right? But that's not what the word says. The word says, oh, no man, nothing but the love. See what I'm saying? Just something that little. And it makes sense. The part he's not telling you is there could be years you don't make no money, right, Jay? And there could be years you lose money too, right? <laughs> See, I don't ever talk about that, right? And for somebody like me who's never, ever lost money, <laughs> I'm just telling you all the truth. I've never lost money. Have we ever lost money, Jay? I've never, I've never lost money in your investments. I've never lost money in mine. 
I'm just telling you the truth. But still, that's not what the word says. That's what brings strife. It's what brings conflict to the word. You're hearing things from the world that's contrary to what the word says. The word tells us, oh, no man, nothing but to love them. Why? Why does God not want us to have debt? Because debt causes you lack of peace. How many of y'all ever owed a bill? How many of y'all have been sitting in church wondering how you're going to pay the bill? Am I going to pay the bill? How am I going to pay the bill? I really don't want to pay the bill. How many of y'all ever been there? I don't really want to pay the bill, right? Right? So it causes you your peace. And what happens when we lose our peace? Say we lose the presence of God. Right? That, that, that's what the peace gives you. Look at this right here. Uh, Galatians chapter 5. Did I read y'all Romans? Yeah, I did. Go to Galatians chapter 5. We're almost done. I'm not going to mess with y'all too much today. Galatians chapter 5. I just want y'all to get this, man. Listen, I'm telling you, man, the enemy tries to sneak. And, and, and man, and, and let me tell you where he does it the most. You know where he does it the most? Between husbands and wives. You know what's the funniest thing? Well, not it's not funny. Let me not say it's funny. The most amazing thing to me is how the enemy can get husbands and wives fighting about church. That's crazy. But Pastor, he's always serving at the church. Excuse me. Uh, he wasn't in nobody's church. Would you rather him be serving too much or not be in the church? Uh, it, it's amazing. All day, pray, 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 pray for him to be in church, for him to come to church, for him to... Now, now he comes to church too much. What, what's up with that? That's what happened. You have men do the same thing. My wife's always at church. Where would you want her at the bar? You want me to send her to the mall? I could do that. <laughs> want to go shop? We could do that. I'll drive her down there, drop her off. <laughs> Amen? Gal Galatians. So let's, let's look at this. We need to understand that the Holy Spirit was given by God to give us peace. That's what we got to understand. Galatians chapter 5, and all of y'all read this. I just want to read it to you in this message Bible because it reads so nice. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. I'm going to start in verse 21. It says, and out of your reverence for Christ, and out of your reverence for Christ, see that? Out of your reverence for Christ, be supportive of each other in what? Love. Do you see that? Love. You got that? Y'all got it? Am I reading it right? Oh, we don't have it. What happened to the screen? Y'all don't have the screens on tonight? It's on? It's on? I'm not seeing it. Y'all see something on that screen? Oh. Oh. Are the screens on, Jeremiah? Oh, you keep shaking your head, they're on, and I don't see anything on. Oh, oh. well, tell me something, man. I'm looking at it. You're telling me, uh, Jeremiah, are they on? Yeah. I'm like, okay, can we put it, can we put the scripture up? Uh, has the scripture been on? That's what I'm asking. Okay, all right. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, okay? Ephesians chapter 5. Oh, I'm sorry. I said Galatians, didn't I? Y'all are right. See, I was wrong. My bad. I was wrestling with the screens. Galatians chapter 5. Are you trying to confuse me again? It's Galatians chapter 5. We're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Come on, man. Y'all ought to know that. I was the one who was wrong. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. All right? Y'all there? All right. Um, let's start in verse... This Bible reads a little different. Anyway, I'm going to start right here. It says it's right before verse 22, so it might be 21. I just... It, this is... It's not marked in this Bible. It says, Haven't I already warned you that those who use their freedom... For these things will not inherit the kingdom realm of God. He goes on to say in verse 22, but the fruit produced by the spirit within you is divine love in all its varied expressions, right? He goes on to say joy that overflows, right? He says peace that subdues. That's what I wanted you to see. The peace of God will subdue you, right? Patience that endures, kindness in action, and a life full of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart, and strength 
of the Spirit. Now, I want you to understand something. It says here, joy that flows, peace that subdues, patience that endures, kindness in action, a life full of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of the heart, watch this, and strength of spirit. I submit unto you what God is telling us here, that if we operate in joy and we operate in peace and patience and kindness, faith and gentleness, we will be strengthened by the word of God to win any battle. But we got to come to that realization. And again, you're not ever going to operate in the fullness of God in you if you allow things to come to you that are contrary to the word of God. So you have to realize whether we believe it or not, in this world there will be battle and there will be conflict. Go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 in the King James. 1 Peter chapter 5. Very back of the Bible. Very back of the Bible. Christians that avoid conflict, Christians that avoid battle are like fighters that don't want to get in the ring. You've been trained for battle. You've been trained for conflict. Matter of fact, the only way you know where you're at is if you are in the ring battling and conflicting. And the only way we're going to win is we got to stop strife. We have to stop things that are coming into our, 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 our frequency of thinking that's contrary to God's word. That's what we have to fight for. See, you're fighting so hard to stop smoking weed and you're focusing on that so much that you just need to focus that God loves you and you don't need weed. And then you won't have to fight trying to stop smoking weed because his love and your realization of that love and what that peace will bring you will allow you to do that. Does that make sense? I had to realize God loved me whether I could refrain from doing wrong or not. He still loved me. The difference was if I could not get the thoughts out of my head that led me to that road, then I'm not going to be able to do everything God called me to do. And that's not bad. He still loves me, but I just can't do that. So you have to come to the point where pleasing the Father becomes important to you more than pleasing your flesh. That's the key. And, you know, you know every time we say the word flesh, we always think of sex. Flesh, flesh ain't sex. Flesh is eating Flesh is not, how, how many of y'all in here have ever woke up in the morning and said you was going to get up and exercise in the morning and you wake up in the morning and you hit the snooze button? Anybody? Can I see all my snoozers? Let me raise both my hands. All right. That's flesh. It's not sexual. It's not a drug. It's not alcohol. Right? We always think of flesh that way. Flesh is anything when God tells us to do something and there's a struggle to do it, that's the flesh. And we have to renew our mind to why we do what we do. That's why you got to renew your mind about work. You know, a lot of people want to own businesses today. You know why? So they don't have to work. Say, fool. Miss Veronica, you work? Hard. <laughs> Remember what she said? Hard. Right? Right? When the bell rings, you got to go, right? Whether you feel like going, not feel like going, can go, should go, shouldn't go, right? Yeah, owning a business is no joke. I don't know why people think that you go own a business and then all of a sudden, you know, you live in La Vida Loca. It does not work that way, folks. I and I love the most, all these people want to get into sales. They've never done sales. All these sales jobs. You have no clue, none. And every sales job requires something different. Some sales jobs you're gonna win just by being there, but you're gonna be there. Uh, how many hours a week your sales car sales guys work there? 80, 80 hours a week. That means no Saturdays, no Sundays, right? Yeah, they make a thousand or two thousand dollars a week sometimes, but they're there 80 hours a week. So you just gotta ask yourself. Because, see, if you're not there 80 and you're there 79, instead of making 2,000 that week, you'll make 200. 
See, because the breakthrough comes, the breakthrough don't come between 40 and 80. It comes between 75 and 80, right here. That, that's where it happened. Oh, that's the way they set it all up. They always set it up for, 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 the, for the suckers to lose. Because they know you're not going to stay there and do it. I remember one year, man, at Box Air, we were on a $2,500 per 1% bonus. So that meant every percent, over 100% we went, we got an additional $2,500 on top of our commission. So for every one, this is the year I made a million dollars. For every 1% we went over 100%, I was making like $6,000. For every 1%, do you think they had to call me on Christmas Eve to go to work? <laughs> New Year's Eve, you think, where do you think I was New Year's Eve? Oh, 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 I had everybody at work on New Year's Eve. Oh, they was all there. When, when the clock strikes 12 and it's over, I will take y'all out. We can go dance to this 1999. But until 12 o'clock strikes... We're going to be right here putting all these orders in. Amen. Amen. Man, we blew it out. Man, we were just racking up the money, right? That's how comp plans are designed. So see, if you're lazy and you're trying to go into sales because you want to eat, you, you'll never make it in sales because you're the guy that they take all your would-be money and they give it to me. That's how it works. It's, it's Leroy, tell you, he writes comp plans. I write comp plans. We write comp plans that take from the bottom 50 yep. and give to the top 10. Yep. That's exactly how we write the comp plan. We're just like Jesus. <laughs> oh, hold on, hold on. Oh, hold on. In the Bible, the parable of the talents. How many people read the parable of the talents? What did God do with the one who didn't make no money? He took his and gave it to who? The one that made the most. Oh, yes, he did. And then he took the one that did make no money and sent him to hell. Go read the Bible. Go read the Bible. Yeah, how sweet Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How sweet was that? Listen, folks, God, God rewards doers of the word, not hearers only. Amen? So go to 1 Peter. Oh, yeah, it's a battle out there. Ain't nobody going to give you nothing. Trust me. But let me tell you something. When you get Christ in your life and you get Christ on your side, you don't need nobody to give you nothing. You really don't. You had to kiss no tail. You don't have to suck up to nobody. It don't matter what color you are, how educated you are, how not. A guy talked to me today about a whole job of things. You got to have an MBA. You got to have this. You got to have this degree. The guy never asked me one, not one of those questions. Do, do, do you have an MBA? I wish he would ask me that. Yeah, I got an MBA, a track record of never failing. How about that MBA? <laughs> Amen. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter and verse 8. 5 and verse 8. Let's read it in the Amplify. I mean in the, the King James first. He says, likewise... You younger, submit yourselves unto the elders. Yea, all of you be subject to one another and be clothed with what? Humility. Do you see that? For God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Do you see that? He says, verse 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Do you see that? Yes, sir. Now watch verse 8. Be sober. You know what that word sober means? It don't mean not, don't not be drunk. It means have a sound mind. Be thinking. Stay on your toes. That's what he's saying. Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary the devil. Do you see that? God called him your adversary. God said he is here to oppose everything that's good about you that God has created in you from before the foundation of the world, there is an adversary to come against it. And he tells us how to handle them. He says, your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion walking about 
Seeking whom? Seeking whom? Seeking whom? He may devour. You know what that means, Mr. Darden? It means he can't devour anybody. Who can't he devour? Those that align themselves with the word of God. When you align yourself with the word of God, the enemy cannot devour you. Why? Because now you'll be able to resist the devil. Why? Because you have the word is in you. Go to Psalms chapter 103. Psalms chapter 103. Two more sets of scriptures and we'll be done. Y'all okay? All right. Because I want to show you this one about not giving them no room. Psalms 103. So we got we to line our thinking up with God's thinking, right? Psalms 103. I'm going to read it in the Passion. Psalms 103. Look at this. He says, with my whole heart, with my whole life, and with my innermost being, I bow in wonder and love before you, holy God. He says, you are my soul's celebration. How could I ever forget the miracles of kindness you have done for me? You kissed my heart with forgiveness in spite of all I have done. You have healed me inside and out from every disease. You've rescued me from hell and saved my life. You've crowned me with love and with mercy. You satisfy my every desire with good things. You've supercharged my life so that I soar again like an eagle in the sky. You know who is writing that? David's writing that. David just lost his child. David was a murderer. David was a killer. I don't care what you have done. If you will surrender to God, if you'll submit your life to God, God will forgive you. God will restore you. God will set you straight. You cannot allow the enemy, the accuser, to come to you and try to bring your past against you. If you've done something wrong, go to the person you've wronged and ask them for forgiveness. Be sincere. And then get on with getting in to God's word. Amen? Amen. Let's look at this. We'll close right here. Go to Ephesians. Look at this. This is so good. God loves us, man. The enemy's always trying to convince us of contrary things. Amen? Ephesians chapter 4. Go to verse 17. Let's start there. We're going to read, read quite a bit of this. Let's start in 17. Ephesians 4, 17. This is our new life in Christ. Say, Christ has a new life for me. But pastor, I got born again a while ago. You know you get born again every day? You do. Let me ask you a question. Did you learn anything new tonight? Was your mind renewed to anything new tonight about Christ? So you just been born again new. Because you didn't, you didn't recognize it. It wasn't even that you didn't know it. But you recognized something new. So now you have something new. So now you can grab more of God. Amen. Now you can grab more of God. We're born every day. That's why I get in the Word every day. That's why I listen to the Word every day. That's why our program's called Winning in the Word. Why? Because we get the Word and we get to win more. Amen. The more you open up the playbook, the more opportunity you have to throw touchdowns, right? Amen. Why do you think football teams progressively get better throughout the year? Why? Because they're constantly permeating, permutating. They're constantly layering on. They start out with 10 running plays and 10 passing plays. Then the next week, they got 15 and 15. Then the next week, they got 20 and 20. Then the week after that, they finally realized in three weeks, they run the ball way better. So now they just add 10 more running plays. Then 10 more running plays. And that's why you, you see, it just gets better and better and better. And then at the end of the year, you look like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. <laughs> World champions. Amen? Right? I even got David saying Amen. He just knows the Steelers ain't going nowhere this year. So, so he got, he's got to be on the bandwagon. He's all right, though. I love him, man. I'm at, did you know Stephen A. is a Steelers fan? I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17. Look at this, man. Just listen to this. He says, so with the wisdom given to me, 
from the Lord, I say you should not live like the unbelievers around you who walk in their empty delusions. Do you see that? Their corrupt logic has been clouded because their hearts are so far from God. Their blinded understanding and deep-seated moral darkness keeps them from the true knowledge of God. Listen, some of y'all need, need to just stop talking to folks. Y'all trying to talk people into believing God. Stop that. Pastor, but you said we called the minister. Invite them to church. Let the Holy Spirit deal with them. Y'all are trying to convince people. I tell you all the time. Y'all mess around talking to them Muslims long enough, y'all be Muslim. Because they believe more in what they believe than we believe in what we believe. Or I should say y'all believe in what y'all believe. Ain't nobody changing me. Amen. I love it. I hop out the car and go at them. When I see them on the side, the, the, the black Israelites, I like them. They know one, they know three scriptures. They taught them three scriptures. They're talking about the different Jesuses. No, no, baby, that Jesus, you're talking about the same Jesus we over here. Here, let, let me take you. The one dude told me one time, how are you doing that without a Bible? I just happen to know more than three scriptures. <laughs> let me tell y'all something. <laughs> Never, ever forget this. Never, ever forget this. God has simple principles and rules. God is not about division. The Ku Klux Klan did the same thing that the black Israelites are doing. Same thing. They wanted to make God a white God. The black Israelites want to make God a black God. Ain't no black God and no white God, baby, because there's a black and a white God. There's only one God, God who loves us all. He created us all. We need to understand that. There is no division. Anytime somebody's preaching division, race, ethnicity, whatever it is, church, division, whatever, just like y'all hear me talk about Catholics all the time. Listen, man, I'm, you know, I'm, they can be what they are. They still love Christ. Amen. I don't agree with everything they teach, but they still love Christ. Do y'all understand me? Seven-day Adventists. I don't believe everything they teach. They still love Christ. They love us enough that we started our church in the seven-day Adventist church. We just, we just believe a little different. That's okay. But they have love in their hearts. Catholics have love in their hearts. They love God, you know. But somebody who don't love God and wants to build something separate, that's not God. God's not looking to separate us. God's looking to unite us. How many scriptures you got to read in the Bible talks about us being one? One faith, one belief, one... I mean, come on, man. And, and you literally sit there and listen? How, how do you get that twisted? Watch what he says here. He tells us. They're blinded. They're blinded understanding and deep-seated moral darkness keeps them from the true knowledge of God. Verse 19, because of their spiritual apathy, they surrender to, to lives of lewdness, impurity, and sexual obsession. You see that? So, so next time you tell me ain't nothing wrong with being sexually obsessed, well, Pastor, you know God's okay with sex. He created sex. Yeah, but he don't want you to be obsessed about nothing. Do you, do you understand that? Amen. But this is not only the way of life that Christians have unfolded within you. But this is not only the way of life that Christ has unfolded within you. If you have really experienced the anointed one and have heard his truth, it will be seen in your life. Do you see that? For we know that the ultimate reality is embodied in Jesus. Do you see that? He says in verse 22, and he has taught you to let go of the lifestyle of ancient men, the old self-life, which was corrupted by sinful and deceitful desires that spring from what? Delusions. See them delusions? Self-life, how you look, how you feel, what I have. Why does he get to do that and I don't get to do that? I, 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 me, me, me. It's not fair. It's not fair. That is the enemy. Record yourself. Listen to yourself. Go look at your timeline on Facebook so you can see it's all about you. 
every picture, every post, everything is about you, what you got, how you look, how you feel, where you go, what you're doing, what's your brand, what's this, what's that. It's not God. It's not God. And we need to think about this. God has called us to impact and influence the world. And we do that by loving others and loving people. Watch what he goes on to say. Verse 22, he says, and I taught you to let go of the lifestyle of ancient men and the old self-life, which was corrupted by sinful and deceitful desires that spring from delusions. Now it's time to be made by every revelation that is given to you. See, this is the word of God. And that you be transformed, do you see it? As you embrace the glorious Christ within your new life and live in union with him. For God has recreated you all over again in his perfect righteousness and you now belong to him in the realm of true holiness. Do you see this? Verse 25, so discard every form of dishonesty. Discard every form of lying so that you will be known as one who always speaks truth. For we all belong to one another, but do not let the passion, watch this, of your emotions lead to sin. Do not sacrifice for us. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Do not let the passions of your emotions lead to sin. Don't let anger control you or be the fuel for revenge. Not from, not for even a day. Verse 27, don't give the slanderous accuser, talking about the devil, the devil, an opportunity to manipulate you. If any one of you has stolen from someone else, never do it again. Instead, be injurious, be injurious. Industrious, that's it. Earning an honest living, and then you'll have enough to bless others who need it. He says, verse 29, and never let ugly or hateful words come out of your mouth, but instead let your words be, become beautiful gifts that will encourage others. By this, do this by speaking words of grace to help them. Do you, do you see these, this word? So what he's telling us is, is we have been renewed. We have been renewed by the word of God. We have to come to a point where we believe God's word and the purpose of God's word, which the purpose of God's word is to renew our thinking from how the world thinks. Amen? I want all of y'all tonight to go through, and I really want you to think about things. Not thinking about, you know, it's, it's amazing because we can all point out sin, you know, when we know it. But we don't see sin when we're off from the way God thinks. We don't think that's sin. And somebody's drinking. And somebody's looking at pornography. Somebody's cheating on their wife. And somebody's beating their kids out of control. What are other things we, we look at sin? Somebody, all the things that we know are sin. You know, got some girl walking around in a real tight short skirt. Ooh, child, look at her. You should have some respect for herself. You know, the whole time you're just gossiping, 24-hour gossiping, right? Whatever, whatever we view as sin. You hear somebody cursing, talking with a real foul mouth, right? Those are all sins that we know. We all know that. But the truth is, what are we doing in our thinking? What, what thought patterns do we have that don't line up with the word? Are some of y'all late to work? Repeatedly, repeatedly late to work. You don't think that's a sin? That's a sin. Some of you steal from your employer. Oh, I'm just going to make five copies for the church. Don't ever make copies for this church at your job. We don't need it. We ain't broke. Now, I'm just going to I'm just gonna take five of these for the church. You know, it's a good cause. No, we, we don't need it. No. Nope. Right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Show up to meetings late. You know there's nothing more disrespectful than being late. Amen. Disrespectful. Amen. But we want to talk about the guy at the bar. We, we, don't, we don't give 110% at our job. 
You know, now we got a lot of people working from home. Let me tell y'all something about working from home. For all y'all like working from home now because y'all got y'all's freedom. Let me tell you something, man. We got analytics and data coming out now on video, live stream. It's going to tell, and you, you can put a little picture in front of it all you want. It's got real facial recognition. And we're going to know how long you've been there. We're going to know how long you attended, how long your eyes looked at the screen. Oh, they're going to do all that. Oh, let me tell you, working from home is going to be the worst nightmare you've ever experienced. Because what they're doing now is now they're creating technology to manage you, not a manager to manage you. Yeah, which is much, yeah, because he, he, the, the computer ain't slacking up. Leroy will give you a break every now and then because you've been working hard. The computer don't care. Computer wants to know, how come your eyes are supposed to be on this laptop 98% of the time? It was only 82. And here's what's going to happen next. Let me tell you what's going to happen next. Some of y'all who've never been in sales are going to get in sales. Oh, we're paying you. You want minimum wage to be 15 an hour? No problem. We're going to give you 20 an hour. But when your FaceTime drops below 80%, we're going to start taking that percentage out of your check. Oh, let me tell you, it's getting ready to get tight but right. Amen. 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 So what I'm telling you is we have to, we have to, we have to have the mind of God. We have, to, we have to start thinking and examining our lives in areas that we need to think more Christ-like to get our thinking to line up with God's thinking. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody got any questions tonight before we close? Any questions about what we talked about? So we're talking tonight about strife. Not, not, now y'all all know what strife is in, in the marriage or in a relationship, right? Father-son relationship, mother-daughter. We know what that strife is. That's just y'all disagreeing. We get that. I'm talking about other kind of strife. I'm talking about where you struggle with the word or you struggle getting beyond strife. Any questions about any of that? Any of that tonight? Any questions? Online, do we got any questions? Are we looking online, Natifa? Yeah. If y'all have a question, let me know. None of you guys have any questions about strife. Anybody here ever struggle with strife? Yeah. Thank you, Isaiah. Thank you, James. Nobody has a question. Thank you, baby. Thank you. Ashley. You know, it only takes one of y'all to ask, and then we get 50 questions after that, right? <laughs> no questions. I feel like somebody wants to ask a question. Come on now. Go ahead, Ashley. Ashley has a question. Okay, so if you're around somebody and they're bringing strife, right, you first, I'm not telling you you avoid strife that way. You first confront the strife because you do have to confront it. And then if it doesn't get better, then you avoid it. But you first got to confront it because we don't, we don't just run from the issue. We need to sit down and, and have a conversation. Hey, look, you know, I got here a couple of weeks ago. I don't know what I did to you, but, you know, I'm new here and, Every day you have been, you know, kind of coming at me in a personal way, saying things I find a little bit off color. I, I don't know what's going on. Have I done something to offend you or have I done something to make you uncomfortable? So what I do when I'm confronting is I always come to me first because I have, I, I do because I do have a very, uh, um, I could step wrong sometimes. I'm very confrontational, right? So sometimes that's intimidating. So I say, have, you ask me, have I done something or said something to you, first said something to you that has offended you in any way or, or given you a wrong thought about me or have I done something? And I, and I asked you that first. Oh, no, 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 man, you haven't done that. We're cool, we're cool. Okay, well, since we're cool, <clears throat> for us to remain cool, uh, the way that you speak to me is offending me and is concerning me. And the way that you're always arguing and debating with me is an issue. What I would appreciate is if you have a concern with something I have said, instead of saying in front of everybody, just take a little quick note, and when you get me off to the side, let's discuss it. That makes sense? Right. And you got to understand, you have to confront strife, and you have to deal with it, or else it's like a, it's like a bad sore. You know, if you have a sore on your foot, and you don't treat it, that sore's going to keep rubbing and rubbing and rubbing and rubbing. Eventually, you're not going to be able to walk, so you got to treat it. Yes, Latif. Diane asks, what do you do when you think all the strife has been dealt with, then a small thing happens, and you blow up and bring up, bring up all the things that you was feeling all over again? 
Okay, well, first of all, that's evident that it hasn't been dealt with. So it has not been dealt with because you're still obviously harboring it and holding it. And that's the issue. Did you really, when, when you confront somebody and you put it all on the table, you got to let it go. <clears throat> and when you bring it back up, again, like I said earlier in the message, right? In 1932, you know, on the corner of 22nd and 3rd Street, you said this, this, and this about me. That's, first of all, what you got to understand, um, who asked that question, Diane? <laughs> what you have to understand, Diane, here's the thing that you got to really get a revelation of. That is not hurting nobody but you. When you hold that in you, that becomes sick. That turns into sickness in your physical body. That's what y'all got to realize. When you harbor things inside you, it becomes sickness in your physical body. That's why you have to release it. You have to let it go. So don't allow it to come back. That's what you need to do. So whatever you need to do to go back and release that person of all that, let it go. And if you, if you get yourself in a place where you're always coming back to arguing with people or having strife with them, you, you just need to make a decision that you got to let that go. And I, I know what I hear a lot, I don't know that she said this, but I'm going to just add this. A lot of times where we see the most repetitive strife and not being able to just let them go is in family situations. And I'm going to tell you all again, I said it before, Abraham had to leave who? His family. See, and some of y'all don't want to let go of your family, not because you don't want to let go of your family. You don't want to let go of the arguing and fighting. You like it. You like the strife. Some people love, they, they cannot do without something to talk about. When their life becomes good or their life becomes normal, they don't feel normal because they're used to their life having so much strife and turmoil in it. You got to deal with you because I don't care who it is. When me and my wife got married, we separated from her family and we separated from my, my family because her family was racist and my family didn't like us. Okay, very, very, two different, two different dynamics, two very different dynamics. Well, let, let me change that. My father's family didn't like us. Her family was racist and my mom's side of the family loved us. So we did have one side that, that was there, but even then we just, we just separated. We separated because we just, we couldn't trust none of them. We couldn't. And we were, we were there to protect our children. Amen? And she was trying to protect me because you say the wrong thing to her or one of my children, and then it's a whole different situation. And her brothers were real big, so th there was only one alternative for them. <laughs> I, I wasn't, I'm not getting sweaty. Them some big boys. <laughs> yeah, she has some big brothers, Chip. 6'4", 260, 6'2", 340. They were big, yeah. So I wasn't, I wasn't, yeah. Anyway. Do we have any other questions? We good? That's all online? Okay. Thanks. Y'all stand to your feet. Give God some praise. Amen. Let me read to y'all just a couple of scriptures before we go. Proverbs 17 and 1 says, A dry, better is a dry morsel and quietness there within than a house full of sacrifice, sacri sacrifices with strife. Proverbs 20 and 3 says, Avoiding strife brings a man honor, but every fool is, a, is quarrelsome. Proverbs 17 and 14 says, starting a quarrel is like letting, water, letting out water. Stop it before strife breaks out. Proverbs 17, 19 to 20 says, he, he loveth transgression that loveth strife, and he that exalteth his gate seeketh destruction. He that has a forward heart findeth no good, and he that has a preserved tongue will fall it, falleth into mischief. So we need to understand there, if, if you go read in the Proverbs about strife, man, there's nothing that good that comes of it. So I just want to leave you tonight with, if there's strife in any area of your life, my wife lived our early part of our marriage on one scripture. We would not let the sun go down on our wrath. We would not let the, this thing about you go sleep on the couch, that, that ends tonight. Nobody don't sleep on the couch because sleeping on the couch one day goes sleeping on the couch two days and then it's three days 
And then it's, I'm not going to sleep on the couch no more. I'm going to stay out. And then I'm going to stay out another day. And, and that's where marriages get in trouble. If you have an argument, if you have an issue, before you go to bed, somebody's got to repent. Y'all can stay up till 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Me and my wife used to fall asleep on the phone. I ain't going to repent. I ain't going to repent either. Or we're going to be on the phone. We ain't, we, we're not hanging up till somebody repents. Amen? And you make, that, you make that arrangement so you don't go to bed angry and mad with each other. If you want a real reason not to go to bed angry and mad with each other, and I hate to do this, but I'm going to do it, it's not a promise that you're going to wake up and they're going to be alive. And how would you feel if you just had an argument with your husband and you wake up the next morning, he's gone. And the last thing you said to your wife was she's a blankety, blankety, blank. How do you feel? How are you going to feel? Amen? Amen. So we need, to, we need to repent and we need to work to keep strife, to keep disagreement out. Pastor, we don't agree on this. Then get somebody that can be y'all's mediator. It was real simple for me and my wife. We had Pastor Greg and Deborah Poe. If we disagreed with something that was a kingdom issue, we had it, we, we had it real simple. We go to them. It was no debate. Wasn't talking about her view or my view. Here's the issue. Here's how she sees it. Here's how I see it. You're wrong. Okay, that was it. I'm, I'm changing. There was no debate. There was no, well, the pastor likes her more than me. N none of that crap. I'm wrong. We're changing. Amen? Amen? I used to be wrong a lot when Pastor Poe was alive. And now, Pastor, it's only Pastor Deborah. I'm always wrong. I have not, I have not been right since Pastor Poe went home to be with the Lord. But how many of y'all know it don't matter? That's my spiritual mom. Hold on. That's my spiritual mom. That's my spiritual authority. That's my spiritual covering. And if she tells me I'm wrong, I am going to go seek the face of God to know where I need to change. Because guess what? I am wrong. That's what surrendering the authority means. Amen. Not, well, you know, is she really wrong? She's really just seeing it Fran's way because she's a woman. And you know how women think. And, you know, I really need a spiritual father. And blah. No, she's my spiritual covering. You got to make up your mind, man. If you're going to let Satan play little tricks with you like that, you're going to always be confused. Amen. But pastor, what if they were wrong? So what? We came to agreement. It got us back to a place of agreement. Right? Yes, sir. That's what you got to do. And when it comes to people, you got to forgive people. Amen? Bow your heads. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this night. We thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you, Father, for each and every person at the sound of my voice, Lord. I thank you for their faithfulness, their commitment to keep coming and hearing your word, Lord God. And I thank you, Father, for the continued transformation of their life and everything you've created it to be from before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.